ago. Here is their response to the questions I posed before them. All right, to start off, what background do you have that relates to mental health? I attended Washington and Jefferson College and received a sociology degree with a, a minor in psychology. And then I went to West Virginia Wesley, I'm sorry, West Virginia University and obtained my master's in social work. And then I was a social worker at Plum. I'm skipping one step because I don't think I'm just going to talk about the education part. I was a social worker at Plum. And during that time, I went back to school to be a school counselor. I went to Duquesne to get my certification in school counseling. So I have a master's. I also had to go to the University of Pittsburgh um, for my homeschool visitor certification to work in a school. So I have a master's plus 45 credits in, you know, the mental health field. Well, I have my master's in social work. Um, I received that from the University of Pittsburgh about five years ago. For the past five years, I've been working in schools. Um, I have experience working in an alternative education placement, as well as in another public school in the state of Pennsylvania. And what is your experience in dealing with teenagers and their mental health? And can you tell me if there's any difference before or after COVID? Well, I would say I have dedicated my entire professional career to um, working with teenagers. I started as a social worker at Plum in 1997, and I became a school counselor in 2003. Um, and, you know, Things often obviously change over the 21 plus years that I've been at Plum. Um, but I, beforehand, I, depression, drugs and alcohol, family problems have always played a role, but also um, anxiety. I would say in the past few years, anxiety has really become uh, more of an issue with our students. And during the COVID, um, I have never seen so many uh, students suffering with depression, anxiety. Um, I've never had as many students who were in partial hospitalizations, um, in ho trying to get to hospitals, but hospitals were booked, um, requesting services for therapists. Uh, some students didn't feel comfortable doing Google Meet therapy, so they were rather limited, but I would say um, COVID made things worse for people who were already having problems. And it also, um, some people had new problems during that time. My primary experience has been as a school social worker. Um, and that has been since before COVID as well as after. Um, one of the things that I'm noticing a lot more than in my previous experience is a lot more feelings of isolation, anxiety, depression um, throughout most of the teens that I work with. And have you noticed any specific trends in students who struggle with, de with depression in terms of their race, gender, or other form of demographics? I would have to look over um, some of the data that we have, but I can't say it's been, it doesn't, from my point of view perspective, it doesn't know a gender, it doesn't know an age. It's, I'd say all, all ages, all genders, all types of interests, all types of students, um, you know, whether they're strong students or maybe they struggle academically, it has hit all different aspects of our society at Plum High School.
I'm trying to think of some data that we did um, come up with earlier in the year um, that showed that grades had slipped. But, you know, that being said, some it's hard to really quantify that. Some of the things the district has done, and I hope this maybe is one of your later questions, but for students who aren't happy with their grades, say that they typically get Bs, and for some reason, given everything that went on, they, they have Cs. The district is allowing students to do a, um, a grade replacement summer, summer school class, meaning say you had a C in biology and you want to take that class over the summer, you can do that for free and we will replace that grade this summer. So that that's hopeful for students who, you know, they struggled and now maybe they're starting to feel a little bit better and they want to improve their grades. I don't have a specific percentage, um, but I can tell you that it is a lot more common than people sometimes think. And so, you know, there's nothing wrong with reaching out for help because that, you know, it's something that affects everybody. Do you have any specific or certain religious or political viewpoints that have impacted your work? That's an interesting question that no one has ever asked me before. Um, hmm. I don't, when I come to work and I work with students, I don't, I really, that's one of, I think, one of my stronger qualities. I, I check all my beliefs at the door and I'm there for the students. And I know that sounds kind of like a cliche, but um I try to view every person that I meet as doing the best they can. So if you assume everybody's trying their best and you're there to help them, you don't look at them through the political, kind of the political view aspect. Um, religiously speaking, um, I guess I'm allowed to talk about this because this isn't related to school. I do, I am a religious person. I do not discuss religion with students, but um, I do pray for them. So the cool thing about being a social worker is it is actually in my code of ethics that I am to be non-judgmental and um, to not let my, my personal views affect what I do professionally. So no, actually none of, none of my personal views affect what I do at all. Have you noticed any specific symptoms in students struggling with depression? I think that was one of the hardest things that we had worked with in during COVID because um, we couldn't actually see them. You know, it's really easy to go be at home and disappear. Kind of, I always joke, it's like the land of denial. You just check out. Um, when you don't have a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction, with either your counselor or your teacher, you can escape to Netflix or video games and just pretend like everything, you know, is okay at school when really maybe your grades are terrible. Um, I did feel like there was a lot of um, checking out. People checked out. They didn't respond. They didn't want to have a Google Meet with me. Um, they, I'd email them. They'd say I'm fine. Um, so I do think. Um, people just checked out. They just were done, if that makes sense. Um, so a lot of students who are struggling struggling with depression will often self-isolate, meaning it's, it's hard to get out of bed or it's harder to get dressed in the morning, you know, go downstairs for breakfast, even things like that. Um, I've seen lots of students who are struggling with depression start to suffer in school as well. So one of the things that we look for is a student who typically does really well and attends school. If all of a sudden they're not doing well, they're not attending, maybe they're not grooming themselves, they're not um, showering, they're not eating. Those are all signs and symptoms of depression to look for and to be vigilant about.
What type of positive or negative COVID mechanisms have you noticed in students struggling with depression? I think one coping mechanism is kind of to get out of your own head. Maybe you're overthinking it. So instead of thinking about it, just do it. Like sometimes we just have to just stop and say, okay, I know this is really hard. I know I'm having, you know, motivational issues, but sometimes I tell students, like, if you think about, if you kind of quantified the number of hours or minutes you spent thinking about what you had to do, you could have done it 10 times, you know? Um, so sometimes just trying to help them get started, just to get moving. I think students who were on set, are on set schedules, like waking up at the same time, some of the worst things that happened happened normally and during COVID really was people staying up all night um, and then not being able to wake up in the morning or logging in, into their class, but then going back to sleep. Um, but I do think structure helps people getting involved in school, socializing, and that was all very difficult during COVID. And I think that really did affect people greatly, the disconnect from their friends, from their activities, you know. And if people had struggles with their family, maybe things weren't great before, you know, and then they were in a kind of a lockdown situation. That was very concerning to me as well. Phones and social media can be both positive and negative. Um, it can be very helpful for students to be able to reach out. There is a national suicide text line. Um, there are, are all these resources online to get help. Um, but then that can also be, you know, a double edged sword because Oftentimes, as most people know, social media is used to compare and can often be the source of many mental health issues or bullying or, um, you know, kind of any comparative issue. In your opinion, what is the best way for students to cope with depression and combat it? I, I highly recommend talking to someone who's an adult, um, whether it be a therapist or um, maybe if you're involved in your church, your minister, your priest, but I definitely thinking, think having somebody who you can set goals with, who can teach you different coping mechanisms, um, to know that what you're going through is temporary and that if you wait it out and you keep trying, things are going to get better, but definitely seeking help, mental health help is what people need. You know, we all could use that at one point in our life or another. Well, the thing that I would urge anybody who's feeling any sort of depression or anxiety or isolation is to reach out to a trusted adult for help. Um, as anybody at the school, come to one of the guidance counselors, come see me, a teacher, a parent. There are tons of resources out there. You do not have to go through this alone. It is it is okay and we will help you. I have just sitting in my office looking around, I've got four things I can see right now are would that are ways to help students who are feeling depressed or anxious or lonely. So please reach out to a trusted adult. That is the first thing I would suggest you do. What are the signs to look for a student struggling with depression? Like signs? Um, you know, there are a lot of them, but I would say a change in academics, a change in behavior, a change in sleep, um, a change, you know, maybe they, they're they sleeping all the time, um, not wanting to be with friends, not talking to people that they used to talk to, um, lack of motivation, lack of interest in things they used to find, you know, pleasurable. Um, you can just sort of almost feel when you're talking to them, the heaviness that they're carrying around with them and they don't know how to feel better. 
a sign to look for, um, as I said before, would be um, decline in grades, um, a change in appearance. So, um, and that's not just saying, oh, I have a different style now. It's when I say change in appearance, I mean, um, you know, it's not changing their clothing anymore or, you know, not showering, not eating. Um, something else that I would look for is pulling away from friends. That can be a big sign and symptoms. Friends are often the ones that notice something's wrong within their friend group. Um, sometimes even before adults, you know, if you notice that a friend is all of a sudden kind of stopped texting or stopped responding to things, those are really important things to take into account and look at. And how would students be able to reach out for help? Well, you know, we have four school counselors at the high school. And Plum, another great thing that the district just did is they realized that, you know, we are primarily career and academic counselors. I mean, I happen to have a, a pretty strong health, mental health background. But, you know, our jobs are also to help you plan for your future and figure out what you want to be and what you want to do and help to get you there. Um, but the district hired a social worker. Her name is Mrs. Jorgensen. And right now she is between OBOC and the high school, but they are looking to hire another, um, another social worker. So she'll just be at the high school. But that is, that was a huge investment to the mental health of our students because she can talk with any student um, who may be struggling and she could maybe meet with them weekly to you know to kind of fill the gap between if they're not quite ready to see a therapist or you know it's just another person who's available to our students and she is very very nice so i think if a if a student would like to reach out to us or if they don't feel comfortable that you know i've had students who have been brought down by a friend or you know, I've gotten emails from other students saying I'm concerned about my friend, what should I do? Um, you know, we just have to know. And sometimes that's the hardest part because people sometimes are very good at pretending everything's OK. Um, and it's hard to know unless someone lets us know. Students can come find me or the guidance counselors in the guidance office. We are all here um, during the school day. I am here as well over the summer. Um, another way to reach out is you can email me. Um, my, my email is on the website. Another important thing to do is there is the you could contact the National Suicide Hotline um, 911. Also, you know, if you're feeling suicidal, if you're feeling you know, like you're going to harm yourself or somebody else, reach out to 911. The national text line is um, 741741. You can text that number 365 days a year, seven or days in a year, seven days a week. Um, I, I urge you to do that, you know, reach out um, to those emergency numbers in that way. There's also the Safe to Say app. Um, you can find the link to that on the website as well. And that is confidential. Do you believe that social media has played a factor in this teenage depression epidemic? I'm not quite sure. I, I'm having worked in the high school before social media occurred and after, I know that it has caused a whole different um, set of problems. Um, and some days I really do feel the bad outweighs the good with the social media because it's very easy to say something not nice to someone um, you would never say it to their face, but you can certainly say it on your phone to them. Um, so I do think it has affected interaction, but in terms of depression, I'm sure it has, but I'm not, I can't really delineate this specific way. I do think it too, also though, when I go to the lunchroom and I see people on their phones the entire time, and they're not, and this isn't just during COVID when you have assigned seats and you're only with one other person at a table. But I do think um, 
it has affected the way we interact with each other. Um, people don't talk to each other as much. People don't say hello as much. Um, it's almost like a, a risk to talk to somebody. Maybe you went to grade school with them and you don't even say hi to them. And that my own kids do that and that drives me crazy. Like, it's not hard to say hello to somebody, but it seems like social media has caused people to not be as um, interactive and friendly. Yeah, I think I think it has. Um, I don't have any research to cite for you at this moment, but I do think that social media definitely plays a role because we often compare ourselves to others on social media. Um, as we all know, we only put out there what we want people to see. So oftentimes that skews reality. Um, but social media can also be a good tool. It can also connect people and act as um, a catalyst for for building healthy relationships. And what type of support system should teenagers or students look for? I know um, we have a program at, at every high, every school in Pennsylvania has a program called the Student Assistance Program. And it is um, a group of teachers, counselors, and outside agency person who um, students can be referred to. And if they are interested and their parent is interested, we can um, assist in having them evaluated for um, different therapy. And this Plum High School does have um, school-based therapy where an outside agency comes into our building and does therapy with probably right now, hmm, maybe 20 students who are getting therapy here at school and um, weekly. And, you know, people just think they're coming down to the school counseling office, but we have a specific room that's set up just for that. And that is through their um, their insurance. So I think knowing what resources are out there and like if a student, say you're worried about your friend, just encouraging your friend to come talk to their counselor or to a teacher or to an adult that they trust to say, something's not right with this person. I, I can't put my finger on it, but I'm seeing like a big change. I'm worried about them. And you know, we can talk to them without saying, Ryan Kmunk came down and he's worried about you. You know, we have our ways that we wouldn't necessarily, um, if you weren't comfortable being a part of it, the, you know, the person who is reporting that they're concerned about somebody. Well, teenagers or students should look for um, should look for again an adult who who listens to them. They should look for somebody who who seems caring and safe. Um, you know, somebody, particularly any adult at the school. Um, you know, a coach, a parent, a friend's parent, um, as somebody who will listen, but then somebody who also will help refer them to the right people. You know, it's sometimes mental health can be scary to deal with on your own, even as a trusted adult. So know somebody who knows the resources in the area or knows where to find them. You can always call somebody at the school to come to get a hold of somebody like me. Do you think teenagers would know where to go for help? Um, I hope that, you know, that is my concern that some of the, maybe the freshmen, I know I haven't spent as much time with the freshmen as I normally do since we weren't in school for so long. But my, my goal is that, um, you know, that my students and every student feels comfortable approaching their counselor. That's part of the reason why we have like lunch duty. And I like to stand out in the hall because a lot of times kids will come up to me and be like, this is Plesco, I forgot I needed to tell you this or, you know, can you do this for me just to be visible in the school and know that we're um, we're kind, caring people who get up every day for the student.
you know, we're not there to teach anybody anything. We're there to support you and advocate for students. That is our primary job. That is the only reason we get up every day. I think they do. Um, I've had a lot of students come down to me and I am fairly new to the district. So I've, I've had students come in and out because they, they hear about me or they hear from their friends um, where to go. But I do think that we need to do a better job of spreading the word. And last question I have. Do you agree that there is a mental health stigma in regards to teenagers in which most wouldn't ask for help? Um, I do. That might be one thing that I think social media has. I have seen different helped with. I have seen different things like to take the stigma away of mental health and, you know, different celebrities coming out saying with the different struggles that they have had. Um, I feel like now compared to 20 some years ago, it's definitely less of a stigma. Um, I feel like, you know, more and more people are struggling with different things. Um, and I think it's a little bit more accepted. Um, and to get help shows strength that you want to change and you need someone to help you. That's what I always tell people, like getting help is the, the strong thing to do. It's, it's the hard thing to do, but it, in the end, it's, it's what you have to do if you want to feel differently. But I hope that what comes across is like, I, I can only speak for myself, Ryan, um, that I, I wake up every day. I love my job. I still love my job after all of these years. And can I help everybody? No, but I, I sure hope I can help as many people as I can. And I hope students feel comfortable coming to our office, to the counseling office, and um, that we can do whatever we, knowing that we will do whatever we can to help them. Well, I think that depends. I think in some, sometimes, yes, I think there's a stigma, but I think as soon as teenagers seek out that help, they realize that it's really not as scary as they think. Um, so please, again, reach out for help. Come find a guidance counselor or a social worker, um, a teacher, anybody will direct you towards us. Now, it wasn't enough to interview just mental health professionals about this crisis. I had to get deeper, and so I needed to interview students and their experience with depression. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a single student to interview. I could only assume that there is still a mental health stigma among teenagers. As an alternative, I interviewed myself. Hello, I am Ryan Kamunk, the creator of the Quiet Crisis Documentary Project. Now, for the student interview, I have to interview myself because I unfortunately cannot find a single student who is willing to be interviewed. I tried reaching out multiple times throughout my friends and social media pages. I can only assume that there's still a mental health stigma among teenagers in which a lot of them won't be comfortable talking about their mental health issues and experiences. So I gotta do it myself. Now to begin, before COVID, I was all right basically, your typical teenage guy. Yes, I did have a few issues here and there and I'll get to that. But I did have a strong close-knit friend group making up two girls and two guys. Now in saying this, I did have a little problem socially at school, especially I had problems like getting a girlfriend and all that. I still have some problem about that right now, but I've stopped caring about it as much. Anyway, this social problem I had led to me going to therapy for a few times, and it really didn't help that much if I'm being honest. So that's why I'm probably still seeking out for help. I did get some help, like I said, with a therapist, but it just wasn't right for me, it wasn't right fit for me. So I still gotta find better help that is right for me. Anyway, 
There's this one experience I had at Kennywood there, before COVID, in which I went there with my friend group. Now, in this friend group thing is though, I was okay for the few, first few hours there. I felt at home, I felt in place. I felt right in with my friend group. The problem is, after that few hours that went up, I immediately felt overwhelmed by the day. I felt like my emotions took over my mind and I could not stop myself. For example, on the Phantoms Revenge, when I didn't want to go on it that day for whatever reason, and they went on without me. So you know what I did? I just stayed put. I knew it was going to take a while. And I just walked around a lot. I just left them. It was not a good move on my part. I'll recognize that. But I did feel overwhelmed by day, exhausted, mentally exhausted. We did meet up another time again at, I think it was like another restaurant. We had lunch and all that. But it got worse a couple hours later when I did the exact same thing. They tried calling me and texting me. I didn't answer. I just wasn't available. I just didn't answer back or reply. And that led to me searching out for my mom because I knew she was there. And basically, I got with her and we went home. I texted my friend group saying everything was fine and that we were good. That day I regret a lot. I regret not telling my friends what was going on, that I felt overwhelmed by that day. Perhaps there was a lot of people there. Perhaps there was like two emotions. There's too many people in our friend group there to run around. But I think also, I just remember this right now. It was also because I did have a crush on a, on a girl at the time. And basically, I was frustrated myself for not making a move on her. And so that's how I dealt with them, my emotions. I was too scared to do it, so I resorted to two just leaving, just getting away from it all, just running away. But that's the issue. You should not confront your, you should confront your problems, not run away from them. Now during COVID, it got a lot worse. If I'm being honest, it was easily one of, and not the worst time in my life. Yes, some good did come out of it, no matter how bad it was, but it's still something I will never want to go through again or I wouldn't want anyone to as well. Now basically during lockdown or quarantine, I had two addictions. One was social media and the other was my smartphone. Yes, they're connected, but it did lead to me relying on them too much and not getting anything productive done all day. But I still struggle with those addictions, but I'm still getting better at them. But during that, I had a couple existential crises. I questioned my faith and all that. I'm a better place right now if you're asking, thank you. But that's not the point. The point is I was socially isolated and felt not wanted. I felt like, what am I doing here anyway? Why am I just here, staying in my room all day? There's no point. And this makes sense that I like, hate weekends because it's something I'm doing nothing all day. And I hate it. I hate being lazy like that. I was during during the pandemic as well, I did get some healthy habits like meditating, journaling, reading. I even started brushing my teeth twice a day, which I should have been. So I've taken, I've taken care of myself a lot better and give me the self-love I need. Because that's what you need to help your mental health better. You need to up your self-esteem. Basically, you have to take care of yourself first and foremost. Now, I did help-wise professionally help. I did not really get any professional help. But it's something I would not recommend if you're going through something like me. Side note, I was and never am diagnosed with depression. I cannot speak of anyone who has on my behalf. So anyway, I did not get any help, but you should get some help if you're going through it like me. Don't do what I did. I'm in a better place right now, but it's not worth it. Now, after COVID, we're considering just recently, Basically, it got a little better, but school sucked. It sucked. It was easy, but it was very hard to learn. I didn't learn as much as I wanted to, if I'm being honest. I can't recall a really single thing that I remember from the past year and a half in any of my 
my courses, AP courses. I took six AP courses this year. I just, it wasn't a matter if I learned it about it or not. It just matters the grade, and that's what sucks. But also, since I was virtual the whole year, due not my own choice anyway, I didn't really feel at home or at place. Like, I was just, I was just there. I, was, I existed there, but for what? None of the teachers really try to reach out as much, which is kind of understandable, but because what can they do really? If you're at home and you're just there virtually, you're not there in person, not there in real time, asking questions and getting to know your classmates. <sighs> yeah, this obviously was not a good time for me. Now, also just recently, I am in the first stage of my life where I can say, for certain that I don't really have any friends anymore. That friend group slowly drifted away for whatever reason. I take full responsibility to what happened, uh, to any role I played in the breakup of this friend group. But I wish no ill will towards any of my friends and I hope they're doing well in life. Now, after COVID, COVID mechanisms. I still rely on my phone. I'm not as much social media anymore got them mostly out of the way still struggling a few times i go off in a few weeks without it and it's good for me it gets up gets down to toxicity it makes me a lot better and calmer and basically the only symptoms i really had during this is that i'm still get, starting to get, in the, get in to know more people and it's working you gotta put yourself out of your comfort zone, which I'm just starting where you to do. I'm just starting deck hockey again. You know, do people. Because I gotta shake the rust off because I haven't played in a year. I'm also trying to go for my local church youth group. See if I can connect to like minded individuals. It's the one I plan on going to is one made of grades 9 to 12, which is good for me. We'll see how that goes. But that's the thing. You have to expand your comfort zone if you want to get better. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to right the wrongs of my past. Now, granted all this, some of it I, the addiction especially, I claim responsibility for. I claim any part, like I said earlier, for what has happened to me. You have to have some accountability and responsibility in your life if you want to be better. Now, now that's, that's basically it. Thank you, and have a good day.